a tale of two coasts. As we get ready to say farewell to 2023, let's check the pulse of two key economic hubs in the US, California and New York. Now, two of the largest states in the nation by GDP, they play an outsized role in the economy, with California's tech hub up north and Wall Street in New York City. And labor was a big issue on both sides of the country, with layoffs in tech and the financial sector, as well as the Hollywood strikes taking a toll as well. The unemployment rate in both states is higher than the national average, at 4.8% in California and 4.2% in New York. So how is this impacting the move from coast to coast? We have Sarah Bone, Public Policy Institute of California Vice President, and Thomas Simons, Jeffrey's Money Market Economist. A welcome to you both. So, Simon, I want to first start with you, being that I'm a fellow East Coaster. So talk about the dynamics here that are at play, because when people think about the New York economy, you you have a lot of these big headlines making it seem like the economy is in trouble there. But give us a reality check. Yeah, I think that those headlines are really focused on some certain dynamics that are very idiosyncratic, right? So obviously, there's a lot of pressure on the commercial real estate sector as it relates to Uh, office space. But if you look outside of that, the the economy in New York is actually doing pretty well. Uh, I I would say that, I mean, just on an anecdotal basis, there are far fewer, you know, sort of spots for rent in, um, you know, higher end retail sectors. I mean, I happen to work uh, between Madison and Fifth Avenue. And so I I have a a really good opportunity to get kind of immediate survey data, we'll call it, uh, you know, from people who work in those higher end retail businesses, and also just kind of a temperature gauge of who's walking around on the street. And I would say that whether it's the return of uh, certain tourists from areas that maybe were uh, restricted from travel before, or just a you know kind of general um, you know surge in domestic tur- tourism as well, we are seeing the crowd levels sort of back to where they were uh, in in 2019, for instance. So uh, I, I think that there is uh, also you know some some untapped potential from more return to office type activity, um, and also you know you mentioned the financial sector being kind of a dominant force here. Uh, for the last couple of years, uh, you know, depending on where you are in the financial sector, it hasn't been, you know, some of the, the greatest years with with interest rates having risen so much and uh, the markets, you know, kind of been very difficult. Uh, if we see rates fall next year, uh, we could see, you know, even a greater surge in activity from from that sector as well. Uh, Sarah, you know, we've been talking a lot about the major companies out of California, but obviously. Uh... California made up of more than just tech companies. You've said that there is still a lot of pessimism around the state economy, despite the relative strength that we're seeing. Seems to pretty much be on par with what we're seeing nationally. What's leading to that pessimism in the state? In my view, the pessimism is really about prices and inflation. There are such signs of strength when we look at the economy in California. Of course, it's not all. There are there are sectors and, and areas that have a bit more challenge, but overall, the economy here is quite strong, um, but Californians are very pessimistic. Two out of three believe that the economy in the state will be kind of worse next year than it is now. And we've seen this pessimism for a few years. Uh, Californians are not feeling great about their personal finances. They're not seeing them on the up uh, in the next six months. And I really do think that that boils down to prices and inflation. Costs were already higher in California before the pandemic and before the recent surge in inflation. Um, And now are even higher. So kind of overall prices up 19% since before the pandemic. You know, even if there are kind of areas where we see improvement, whether it's in gas prices or in rents, um, it, it's still on paper, um, or, or it still feels to families and businesses like it's just really kind of hard to get ahead. Uh, a lot of that, you know, we look at wages and wage growth has been super strong. So on paper, it looks like a $5 an hour uh, wage increase for Californians on average. But after accounting for inflation, it feels like a $1 an hour pay cut. Uh, so just really, uh, you know, harder to kind of get ahead. Californians are not feeling confident about making large purchases. Uh, 75%, according to our recent survey, um, said that they're less comfortable making big purchases than they were even six months ago. So I think we have a lot of uh, room to improve on both kind of, you know, the price side, which would be great, uh, but also on, you know, the the wages, the earnings, whether it's a business uh, or a worker um, trying to get ahead kind of uh, on that side of the calculation, there's a lot of room to improve. And Thomas, to Sarah's point, obviously, if you have wage growth, but it's still not keeping pace with inflation, you're not going to feel as if things are going well, even if you're seeing gas prices go down. How does that pessimism then trickle into other aspects of the economy, things like consumer spending and whether or not people choose to change jobs? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you think about New York City specifically, which, you know, I should 
note is not all of New York State, but if we're thinking about the city, gas prices actually don't matter that much to most people who live in the city. Uh, now, I frequently talk to people who don't own a car or you know find it very novel to even ride in a car in New York City. Uh, so there, the the, the real pessimism, uh, you know, kind of is is sourced within uh, housing costs, right? I mean, like we've seen a lot of uh, you know kind of headlines that that suggest that rent prices are coming down. There's all this supply of multifamily housing coming onto the market. But that's really a lot of projects that are focused in uh, the Sun Belt and in a lot of areas that saw um, inflows of population from people leaving the city. Uh, I don't think that there's a lot more, you know, really affordable housing uh, that, that's been sort of generated within New York. Uh, I think that there are some big real estate development projects that have affordable housing as, as components of them, but they tend to be in the later phases of construction, which we haven't quite hit yet. So uh, overall, I think that there is a, a big affordability problem within the city. Uh, I don't think that we're particularly close to seeing that, um, you know, kind of uh, find some relief. But, uh, you know, the, the fortunate thing for New York is that, uh, you know, a lot of its economy is based on people who don't live in the city who are coming into it. So uh, I think that, you know, the, the people who live in New York are, are probably feeling a lot of that same pressure that, um, that Sarah was talking about. And, and you know, I, I don't see a whole lot of relief coming anytime soon. But, you know, people who are from other places are, are bringing in, you know, plenty of, uh, of economic uh, fuel to, to con continue to, to foster further growth. Sarah, let's pick up on that point that Thomas made, because I, I will tell you as somebody who lives in California, how many conversations I have that have revolve around the cost of living and, and the lack of affordability when it comes to housing, uh, that has led to a, a pretty substantial exit out of the state for those who say, look, I just can't afford to live here. Um, how much of that do you think leads to some kind of correction in the market within the state? That is a good question. We are monitoring closely these trends and in, in population during the pandemic. California saw a net a loss in population, fewer people coming in and, and actually more exits than we'd seen in prior years. Um, even among kind of high income earners who, you know, can, uh, you know, sensibly kind of afford the cost of living to get kind of reap the benefits of being in California. So we're not sure yet if that is, you know, a temporary correction, something that, you know, remote work um, maybe drove, um, or if that is a new trend, um, that there is a turnaround in the kind of draw of California because of housing prices and other costs here. Uh, it's definitely something that California will be watching. We have been, you know, I would say the state government, got, got multiple governors, lots of leaders have been working on what kind of policy could uh, help uh, address the housing supply that is concern that has been building for decades um, and, and really constrains um, constrains consumers and, and residents in, in finding the housing that they want that they can afford. Uh, and so, you know, that's like takes a very long time to like make the corrections in the system that can then flow to private developers and ultimately to those looking for housing. So that's definitely a, a critical piece that California is focused on. But I would say, you know, even, you know, there's some bright spots there and I am yeah, pretty optimistic, but that will take a lot of time to kind of filter through. Uh, and at the same time, unless some of this like draw of California due to the amenities that we have, as you know, at Kiko, our weather and other things, unless those amenities really like become less of a draw to people coming to California, our prices are likely to remain higher here than elsewhere. So, you know, I think that's just a, a reality that we're we're going to be living with uh, unless we're in a new world really um, in 2024 and beyond. Yeah, Sarah, I guess it's all relative. If you're moving from New York, you're coming to California, you're saying, hey, I get a little more space for this high cost. So it doesn't always balance out there. But Sarah Bone, Public Policy Institute of California, Vice President, and Thomas Simmons, Jeffrey's Money Market Economist. Good to talk to both of you. Really appreciate the time. Thank you.